handle the truth. Welcome, folks, to Truth versus News. This is October the 28th, right before Halloween, and things are pretty scary out here. Stage of his mind in America, Jim Fetzer, does that say something about his mind or something terrible about our system? I think it does that. And I also have Brother Scott Bennett, who has had a multiple loss in his life here this last month. So Scott has suffered two tragic losses in short order. First, his father's demise. And now his mother, and Scott, there's a lovely photograph here in the next slide that is a perfect occasion for you to offer some thoughts about your mom, who appears to me to have been one terrific lady. Yep. Yeah, she was. She was, uh, you know, I, I wrote something, and I'll read it. Uh, <clears throat> my mother passed away on Friday, and uh, I wrote a dedication to, to uh, share, and that's probably the best way to just to say it. It is with tremendous sadness and yet unspeakable joy that I must announce the gentle passing of my beloved mother into heaven at 6.59 p.m. last night, a sad day and yet a day for rejoicing and celebrating a life of great achievement and an eternity of promise. God indeed gave me a wonderful gift in having a perfect mother in every real way that mattered. Her strong Scottish character glowed with a joy, kindness, wisdom, strength, courage, optimism, selfless love for others and a supernaturally uncompromising commitment to truth and honor, which was indeed earth-shaking. Whatever thy hand findeth to do, do unto the Lord. <clears throat> and my mother was the strength, the virtue, the truth, in everything that I have ever done in life. Her legacy is my success, and my character was formed by her hands, and my writing from her heart. Everything my hand has ever written, every, any speech my words have ever composed, the music, the imagery, the spirit was colored in the humbling eternal love of my mother. Although a great light has left the earth and darkness has increased, these things must come to pass for this light and life and radiant character now illuminates heaven all the more brightly and is adding to the appearance of Jesus Christ all the more sooner. I know my mother understood the truth. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that she heard the words from God, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom prepared for you since the foundations of the earth. And as I shared with my mother in many conversations, she is now seeing and hearing and experiencing the most important truth in the spiritual life of a human being, and that is, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. My mother now knows this reality and will live in it eternally, and that is our hope and the purpose for our own crying out to God. So let us ask him to give us the same destiny and say to us also, today you will be with me in paradise. Whenever that day comes in our own individual lives, peace be upon you. So that was a, a short dedication that I, I wrote. My mom passed away peacefully and comfortably, but she was... Uh, she was an incredible woman. She was a Doris Day. She was a beautiful woman. She was uh, strong as a, a granite mountain. My mom was Scottish to the core and uh, raised me uh, in, a, in a very Scottish culture. And honestly, Jim, that's where I, I get my serrated edge it's from my mother. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, you know, just growing up with such a blessing. Well, it's a marvelous photograph of you and her together, Scott. And I know she was extremely proud of you for your, all your accomplishments, your courage, your integrity, standing up for the right, for truth and justice, for which we all admire you. She did as well. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank Bless you, brother. Peace with you. We can turn to the more mundane now because while the Democrats shout impeachment, the Republicans are bringing in record-breaking fundraising amounts. 
we can go to the next already, Scott. It turns out the Republican raised a record setting 27.3 million in September, had 59.2 million cash on hand last month. Meanwhile, the Democrats are 7.3 million in debt. It doesn't look as though all of their ranting and raving about impeachment is doing them any good. While Democrats focus on fighting President Trump, Republicans have prioritized voters. We have another record-breaking fundraising month, the highest ever off-cycle to show for it, said RNC Chairwoman Rona McDaniel. Now, we have a very interesting report next about uh, how the parties have reversed their role historically, that the Democrats are now the party of the super rich and the Republicans the party of workers. Dr. Eowyn published this on her Fellowship of the Minds blog initially. I now have it published on my blog at jamesfetzer.org. The next slide shows a lot of the data which was a report by the Wall Street Journal, no less, using the following indicators as measures of socioeconomic class, real GDP, the value of goods and services produced in a congressional district, median household income in the congressional district, type of employment, level of education. By those measures in just 10 years from 2008 to 2018, Democratic voters have become not just the lowest uh, uh, uh. Oh, back. That's okay. Yeah, have, have become not just the rich, but the super rich, whereas Republican voters are overwhelmingly middle class and the working poor. Contrary to the median's malicious stereotype, even in 2008, the GOP was not the party of the super rich. In contrast, in 2008, the Democratic Party was already trending toward being the party of the super rich. And now, yes, the next chart. The, the Democrats now largely represent voters who live in districts with the highest GDP. The median household income of Democrat congressional district was, has jumped 17% to about 62,000. Democrats represent districts with the biggest clusters of high paying professional jobs. Even there's an education gap where the Democrats have increased their share of adults with college degree from about 27 to 34.5%. Okay. The median household income similarly reinforces all these reports, the bar graph, share of jobs in finance and insurance, share of jobs in digital and professional, share of jobs in agriculture and mine, share of jobs in basic manufacturing. It's really a fascinating development, and there's more data where the Republicans are clearly the party of the middle class and the working poor. The vast majority of the GOP's congressional districts had lower GDPs of 22 to 40 a billion compared with the <coughs> Democrats. After 10 years, the Republican mean household income had barely increased to 53,000 from 2008. The Republicans decreased their already minority shares of high paying jobs in finance and insurance from 39 to 35.7% in digital and professional from 36.3 to 28.9%. In contrast, during this 10-year interval, the GOP became the party of honest workers and lower paying jobs, mm. increasing their share in agriculture and mining from 53.9 to 60.5 manufacturing, from 46.2 to 56.4. Republicans barely increased their share of adults with college degrees from 25 to 27%. Meanwhile, if Fox News poll showing 51% of the public supports impeaching Trump over Ukraine, which if true would display stunning ignorance of the facts, was biased by oversampling Democrats by up to 14%, just as it shows polls showing Hillary winning in 2016. Remember, we were told Trump voters might as well not turn out. Hillary had it in the bag. They were oversampling Democrats, women, and self-declared progressive to make it turn out the way they wanted. Here we have another example of a rigged poll. Scott, I welcome your comment. Well, the first thought that comes to mind, of course, is the change in America's economy, uh, largely in the technological, internet, social media sectors, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of the computer programs, Cisco, and all of these things 
is reflective of a personality change. Uh, the, the personality- You could leave off that last image, Scott, that last- Certainly, yeah. certainly. Oh. The, the uh, personality uh, change in the American economy um, explains the, the, the tendency of the Democrats to become super rich um, and, and uh, you know, really become almost tyrants because we're used to in America equating rich people with very smart men, good leaders. They are captains of industry. They know how to manage budgets and men. They're multi-talented. They're visionaries. They're uh, building to build a better country, a better nation, a better state. They're, they're philanthropic by nature of producing. Uh, that was always our Walton-esque historical expectation of successful uh, captains of industry and, and, and businessmen. And we also always recognize there is a price for that sort of sacrifice of time and energy. And there is a sympathy almost for the super rich, um, you know, the Donald Trump types and others. That, that was from the 1940s up until I'd say the 70s and 80s. And uh, what's happened is it's flipped upside down. You've got this, this uh, technological sector where people invent the internet or invent apps or invent YouTube or invent uh, all of these things and they instantly are on the stock market and suddenly they're multimillionaires based on paper and uh, imagery and uh, it, it, it also reflects uh, these people who, who invent these sort of things are, are somewhat cold and inhuman and there's a there's a there's no uh, there's no genuine compassion or, or sense of godliness they're running towards these transgender or humanistic opinions or perspectives or AI, and they're almost trying to dehumanize the earth and uh, make it uh, some sort of Star Trek Borg, uh, you know, nightmare. And and I think that's that's a reflection of, of uh, the economic the economic distribution. Now I, I, we'll see how this goes. I think a lot of these companies are going to be disintegrating very quickly. But uh, you know, the other the other close is. People's discontent in this country with the viciousness of the left and the media and Antifa is going to carry Trump into re-election, I believe. I don't think Trump is going to be making more wars. I think he is smart enough to stay away from that. I think what we're going to get into later about al-Baghdadi is a sign of that. It is his pivot point so that he can officially and with pageantry and music and grandstanding say, we have turned a corner and we will never go back and he will march us in the direction. That's why they're sort of falling all over themselves, trying to celebrate Baghdadi, yet then they, they realize the hypocrisy. So the media and the left are really becoming more schizophrenic which with every move of this. And I said this on Press TV, so I know we'll get into it later, Jim. We will. Oh, by the way, time out. Did you Meanwhile, the bitter twice-failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton has accused Tulsi Gabbard of being a Russian asset. This is lunacy. Uh, uh, saying that this week's presidential debate, Gabbard took a minor shot at Hillary by saying, when I look out at the country, I don't see deplorables. I see fellow Americans. Tulsi is making important points, and Hillary is, of course, offended. As the next slide shows, Hillary's attack on Tulsi sows more democratic division than Moscow could ever dream of. In her zeal to beat off challengers to her party's hardline anti-Russian orthodoxy, Hillary has only succeeded in sowing discord between the crop of democratic presidential contenders. How very Putin-esque of her. Unfounded blaming yeah, I'm sorry, Scott, I wasn't quite. Yeah, unfounded blaming of Russia for her own woes is nothing new from Hillary, who still blames the Kremlin for denying her the presidency three years ago. It was, if it wasn't Russian hackers breaking her emails, it was Russian bots backing Bernie in the Democratic primary or Putin convincing the Green Party's Jill Stein to mount a third party challenge. So none of these assertions were founded in reality. Russia bashing has become Hillary's stock and trade. Meanwhile, even Matt Tiabi, who writes for Rolling Stone, who's a left center but not an idiot, asks, everyone's a Russian asset? 
America laughed at Hillary Clinton's remarks about Tulsi Gabbard, but her ideas fit perfectly in the intellectual mainstream, writes Matt Tiavi. Hillary Clinton, not long ago, the nominee of the Democratic Party, had some choice words about the state of American politics Friday. I'm not making any predictions, but I think they got their eye on somebody who is currently in the Democratic primary and are grooming her to be the third party candidate. Clinton said on a podcast with former Barack Obama aide David Polk, she is the favorite of the Russians. Clinton appeared to be talking about Hawaiian <laughs> Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, a con combat veteran, <laughs> a major in the Army Medical Corps with two tours in Iraq. Uh, she wasn't done, <coughs> also teed off on Green Party candidate Jill Stein. Jill Stein's also a Russian asset. Yeah, she's a Russian asset, I mean totally. They know they can't win without a third party candidate. She went on to talk about Donald Trump. I don't know what Putin has on him, whether it's both personal and financial, I assume it is. This is now Matt Tiabi saying, Hillary Clinton is nuts. She's also not far from the Democratic Party mainstream, which has been pushing the same line for years. Less than a week before Hillary's outburst, the New York Times, once a symbol of stodgy, hyper-cautious reporting, ran a feature called, What Exactly Is Tulsi Gabbard Up To? The piece speculated about the suspicious activities surrounding Gabbard's campaign using quotes from neoconservative think tank, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, to speculate about Tulsi's Russian support. This was the second such article the Times had published. In August piece, Tulsi Gabbard thinks we're doomed. Yet nearly all the same talking points, quoting Clint Watts, an ex spook from the same think tank, calling Tulsi the Kremlin's preferred Democrat and a useful agent of influence. The Times article echoed earlier pieces by the Daily Beast and NBC that said many of the same things. Meanwhile, <laughs> is the Democratic Party on suicide watch? Yep. You'd think that Hillary Clinton might come up with a better zinger than Russian asset when she flew out of her volcano on leathery wings Friday and tried to jam her blunted beak through Tulsi Gabbard's heart. Much speculation has been brewing in the Webiverse uh, that the flying reptile of Chappaqua would, might, might seek an opening to join the Democratic Party 2023 for all. Wasn't Russian asset the big McGiffin in the Mueller report? the tantalizing and elusive triggering device that added up to nothing? And aren't most people over 12 years old onto that con by now? <laughs> it's not like Tulsi was leading the pack with two cable news networks and the nation's leading newspapers ignoring her existence. She must have been wearing her Kevlar flak vest because she easily fended off the aerial attack and fired back at the squawking beast with a blast of napalm. Great. Thank you, Hillary Clinton, you, the queen of warmongers, embodiment of corruption and personification of the rot that has sickened the Democratic Party for so long have finally come out from behind the curtain. From the day I announced my candidacy, there's been a concentrated campaign to destroy my reputation. We wondered who was behind it and why. Now we know. It was always you through your proxy. Ouch. The skirmish just raised the question, though, is the Democratic Party so sick and rotten it would resort to entertain Hillary Clinton as a 2020 nominee? For sure, I'd say. The party has been on suicide watch since the Mueller report blew up in their face. At this point, it's choking to death on its current leaders in the race. Apart from his incessant, hapless blundering on the campaign trail, Joe Biden will never survive, assisting his son Hunter's grifting ventures in foreign lands, it's just too cut and dried and in your face. The kids scam millions out of Ukraine and China and it's all documented. Mr. Biden will soon announce his retirement from the field to spend more time with his family or for vague health reasons. And indeed, I got a poll from the Democratic Party being conducted on October 23rd. Do you think Hillary Clinton should run for president in 2020? <laughs> I didn't respond, but they might as well. It would guarantee an even greater landslide for Donald Trump, which I confidently predict. There's no doubt about it. 
Hillary is a total disaster for the Democrats, even worse than the Mueller report, which we know blew up in their face. Scott, your thoughts? Fascinating to watch the implosion of the Democrat Party. Jim, that tweet that uh, Salsi Gabbard sent out sounds like it was written by you and I and Don. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's profound in the uh, stupidity and the hypocrisy and the madness of Hillary Clinton. And her blood poisoning, of course, drips into the life and the bloodstream and the mental just existence of all these other Democrats and these mainstream media people. But we've said it before, and we need to keep saying it so people are comforted in how to understand this madness. And that is the Democrats have been given over to madness and wickedness like Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament when he went out and ate grass for seven years. Nebuchadnezzar went out and he said, look at this great you know, city. I built it. And God said, thou fool. And he gave him madness and put him out like the beast. I seriously, honestly think God is doing that to the Democrats and people like Hillary and others. Because of the madness and the death and, the, and, the, and all of the evil that we've sown for 20 years, and even longer, but I mean, really under Obama, and I, I think Trump came in and it, it broke them, and they've never been able to get over that brokenness. They've been like a, a wounded deer that is mortally wounded, and they're running, and they're flailing, and they're screaming, and they're scratching, and they're, they're hitting themselves on the head and saying, if you don't vote Democrat, I'm going to kill myself, and, and we're just going with almost a panic shock and also a bemusement. There's nothing more I love to see than Democrats set themselves on fire in, their, in, their, in the heat of their own lies. But we're looking at them with a quizzical, bizarre, what is going on in this country? Well, we shouldn't be surprised because we've had in this country 50 years of toxic education, perverted family policies, rampant no-fault divorce, atheism, environmentalism, and every corruption being uh, put into the schools, into the churches, and the social fabric it has, has been withered. It's like bleach has been poured onto the cotton vesture of our, of our national uniform, and it's all just kind of withering. And perhaps that's what God is doing to remind us that our kingdom is, is not of this earth. It's not in this country. It's, it's in the heavenlies. However you define it, wherever you're going, I fully support everyone's journey along the path of spiritual enlightenment. And, and I know, you know, our, the passing of loved ones and death kind of brings us into a solemn moment of reflection, but it's essential to reflect on the, uh, on the spiritual eternal things to give context and understanding to the temporal, political, social, and economic ones and the legal ones. I see great battles coming to this country because the Democrats are so ferocious, so lunatic and homicidal, but I don't see them winning because the majority of, of good people in this country uh, are going to be coming to the side of, of Donald Trump. He's not going to be engaging in wars. He's going to be making a turn in the foreign policy realm. Domestic policy is taking uh, root. He's built the wall. Uh, he's, he's going to be empowering the citizens with the Second Amendment right He's going to be writing executive orders to defend that. That is going to blunt and the, the red flag laws and all of these threats of the police going in and taking people's guns because a coworker accuses you of being somehow dangerous. All of that is going to be thrown out. That's a last gasp of desperation for the Democrats. But the police don't back that because they don't want to go around and get killed. And that's what would happen if they started trying to confiscate American law, guns. So the police are not on the side of that. The veterans are not on the side of that. The good folks in flyover country are not on the side of that. It's only the Silicon Valley, the, the Hollywood schizophrenic pedophile rings, the Jewish Zionist uh, New York, uh, you know, I don't know how you, you describe their corruptions up there, but the country I think is going to be amputating uh, a lot of the things we've tolerated for 50 years out of a sense of American compassion. I think those days are ending because we're seeing there's no compassion, there's no tolerance, there's no desire for an equal debate of, of things in this world. It is now entered, you're either believing in all the things that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats want, you're either you're you know, uh, selling yourself into white slavery because you owe reparations and you're a domestic terrorist if you're a white Christian heterosexual alpha male. If you don't do these things, we're gonna kill you. All right, now my back's against the wall. So now you're going to force conservative heterosexual alpha males to do what comes naturally. 
and that is win whenever there's a fight put to them. So I look forward to winning, Jim. Yep. You got it. I think you got it spot on. Don, you wanted yeah. to add a thought? Uh, oh, he, he says it all. I, Scott's a genius as far as good and putting the words together. Resume, yeah. Okay. Among the great ironies of the situation is that Donald Trump has come to the defense of Tulsi Gabbard taking on Hillary over Russian conspiracy theories. President Trump took to Twitter Saturday to defend Tulsi Gabbard against Hillary's claims that she is a Russian asset designed to upend the 2020 presidential election. So now crooked Hillary is at it again, Trump tweeted. She is calling Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard a Russian favorite and Jill Stein a Russian asset. As you may have heard, I was called a big Russia lover also. Actually, I do like <laughs> Russian people. I like all people. Hillary's gone crazy. Meanwhile, the New York Times self-edited the story to hide what she had actually said, her claim that Russia was grooming Gabbard. The New York Times self-edited a story to hide Hillary Clinton's claim that Tulsi Gabbard was being groomed by Russia, instead making it appear as though Hillary had said Republicans were grooming Tulsi. Last week, Hillary told David Plouffe, I'm not making any predictions, but I think they've got their eye on somebody who's currently in the Democratic primary and are grooming her to be the third party candidate. She's the favorite of the Russians, which was lunatic. Hillary waded into the Democratic primary on Friday by suggesting Russia was backing Representative Tulsi Gabbard of a wife for president and that Republicans rather than Russia we're grooming her as a third party candidate. How bad is that? It appears as though the New York Times is literally trying to change history to cover for Clinton, given the massive backlash she received for falsely claiming Gabbard with a Russian asset. Unbelievably bad. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was interviewed on press TV about this whole brouhaha and reported Hillary is a narcissist and infatuated with herself. The baseless allegations made against U.S. lawmaker Tulsi Gabbard by former Secretary of State and Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton underscores her unstable character and narcissistic behavior, says an American academic and analyst. Last week, Hillary suggested Russia might promote Gabbard as a third party candidate to sow chaos in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Tulsi has denied considering a third party bid and multiple Democratic presidential contenders defended her from Hillary's claim. This certifies, which many of us have discerned for some time, that Hillary Clinton is in fact clinically insane, said James Henry Fetzer, a retired professor of philosophy at the University of Minnesota. She is setting up the Democrats for a complete disaster in next year's presidential election. That's her told press TV on Friday. She is so narcissistic and infatuated with herself that she's even plotting to run again in 2020. That's her added stunning stop. Meanwhile, President Trump brilliantly canceled the Washington Post and New York Times subscription across all federal agencies saving the taxpayers a bundle and preventing the spread of fake news. No more yep. lies and fake news from you. Brilliant move. Stunning. Earlier this week, President Trump told Fox News host Sean Hannity he might cancel the White House subscription to the far left Washington Post and the New York Times. On Thursday, he kept another promise by canceling the subscriptions across all federal agencies, probably leaving the two uh, fake newspapers on life support because this would have a devastating effect upon their bottom line. Something very big just happened. Trump was about to announce the uh, reported death of uh, the, the head of ISIS, but some of us are not quite convinced that this in fact has happened. Next. Russia, Russia doesn't have reliable information on the U.S. operation in Syria to neutralize, where the Russian Ministry of Defense announced it does not have reliable information regarding the U.S. operation in Idlib that allegedly resulted in the death of the terrorist leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They are skeptical, and Scott, I must confess, I am 
and I know you I, are as well. I am too. Next I am too. Week. Here we go. And, but get this, the Washington Post mourns the passing of the austere religious scholar Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Reactions vary to the U.S. killing of ISIS terrorist chief Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. However, perhaps the most alarming headline was a sympathetic obituary from the Washington Post. If this doesn't beat it all, Scott, I am stunned. We wait your commentary. And yeah, stop share, stop share for comments on this, Scott. Well, uh, I think it's a brilliant move for Trump to cancel the New York Times and Washington Post. And that is absolutely brilliant because it will instantly, as a tsunami, cleanse the, the uh, beaches of uh, all the garbage that these, uh, these newspapers mount up. And it'll set a tone. And it's, it's absolutely great. He, he, and, he, and, he sh and he should say that. I mean, oh, I don't pay attention to the New York Times. They're a bunch of liars. Next question. And just make them so irrelevant that they, they will just rot and rust from inside. And what Trump does is the national spokesman like Roosevelt, I'll never forget my grandmother uh, on my father's side always said, well, we, we used to listen to Roosevelt and he always gave us hope. And that warm, fuzzy feeling, regardless of so, some of his socialistic practices or policies and stuff, but the warm, fuzzy feeling he gives people was what kept him in office, of course, and made him loved. And uh, there, there's, there's a human Im Im intimacy and emotionalism there that flyover country have. The intellects and the pundits and the analysts and the people who work in this, they, they look at it like a calculating science, but the, the people in Heartland America that work, that are ranchers, farmers, you know, plumbers, electricians, the people that are, you know, care about it, their lives and their family that don't pay attention to this stuff, they connect and listen to the personality of the president. So, when Trump does things like this, uh, he he knows and the people know what it does. The media may not because they're already somewhat emotionally detached and arrogant and stupid. And uh, there is a great book by Richard Weaver called Ideas Have Consequences. It's a great book and it describes the the natural corrosion and, and uh, uh, sort of sickness that comes into society when an information flood newspapers or stories that dwell on negativity or constant uh, perversion, that has a corrosive effect on the larger macro society. So in a sense, it's better to divorce yourselves from all of the evil and the corruption and the things that evil corrupt people do to themselves. I always say Democrats are evil or ignorant. All criminals are Democrats and all Democrats are criminals. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about that. You divorce yourselves. I mean, some are learning and we hope for their salvation, but some are, I mean, the, the American people separating themselves from that is, is very healthy. And of course, Baghdadi, I said it on Press TV, I did an interview and I said, look, this is, this is for domestic policy consumption. This gives Trump a pivot point. This gives him the opportunity. And he said, I want to thank Russia. I want to thank, he didn't thank Iran. I think, you know, I think he could have, that would have shown greatness in a sense to him. He didn't have to get all flubbery, but he could say, you know, and I have to admit Iran has done good things in this. He's got to begin setting the tone, setting the foundation so that they can't rip it down for uh, extending a helping hand and a friendship to Iran uh, in 2020 and beyond. He's got to settle this. There's no point in letting the Zionists continue. But he did recognize Russia, and he's doing that out of public relations, a public relations psyop. And the Russians, of course, are very, very blunt and direct. Well, we don't have reports, and we don't. We killed him last month. Well, okay, the American people don't know that, so let's just you know keep that aside. Uh, but this is this is for pageantry and for influence operations for the for Trump to do this. But. Uh, Baghdadi, of course, if you want to go into him, he was a CIA Mossad operative. You know that, Jim. You've got the tremendous research oh, on him and his background right. and, and all of the evil. I mean, he was, a, he was a, also tied in with the British. The British probably are the most terrorist-loving, terrorist, terrorist -loving, uh, I mean, crazy regime we've ever seen in the, in the latter half of the 20th century because they were the ones who bought the Toyota trucks. They were the ones who did the videos. They were the ones who did the, a lot of this intelligence. It wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Iranians, it wasn't the Syrians, it was the British. The British and the Israelis and the Saudis. And I wouldn't be surprised, of course, if Trump is being lied to all the time uh, by, by people saying, sir, we've got reports of this. Well, how do you know? Well, our, 
contacts within contacts and sources within sources or calculating and this is how it is. You know, military people have a way of saying things in a very stupid way because they're very stupid, but they're also very smart in being limited and being stupid. So Trump, who has a million things going on, can't really ferret this stuff out. And he kind of says, okay, well, let's turn it into a positive. So let's, let's see if we can turn this into a positive. And I said on Press TV, he needs to make uh, a renewed friendship with Russia. I'll say this, Jim. I loved it when I was on Peter LaBelle's show on Crosstalk in 2015. And I said, Hillary Clinton financed ISIS. Hillary Clinton financed terrorism. She did it with Union Bank of Switzerland. She did it with Covington and Berlin. She did it with Eric Holder, Lanny Brewer, Loretta Lynch. She did it by throwing Brad Birkenfeld in prison. She did it by the WikiLeaks cables that Brad had that he gave me that discussed Abdullah Aziz, Igor Lenikov, uh, Chinese Ugars going from Guantanamo Bay back to Switzerland. I know all of this stuff that that witch from the West did. And I said it on Russian TV. You want to call me a Russian asset? Go ahead. I take that with a beautiful button and I polish it with joy. But I did it as an American soldier, warrior, officer, patriot for my constitution because these bastards are domestic enemies. And that's what I swore to defend against. And when the Russians came to me and said, tell us your story, Mr. Bennett, I say, God, here it is right now. When the press TV Iranian said it to me, here it is right now. New York Times didn't talk to me. Washington Post, well, I guess they did because they sent Tom Hamburger of the Washington Post to come talk to me and Michael Isakoff of NBC News to come talk to me. So all of this stuff we know is part of a long, big puzzle that's slowly coming together. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing it all blow up in their faces, Jim. Well, I watched your interview with Michael Stringman on Press TV, hosted by Marzi Hashimi, where you were cut off. Your connection was interrupted yeah. three times. Yeah. You only were able to finally observe your skepticism about this taking place. What bothers me is, has Trump been played over this? Because I would be very surprised. But I tell you, I, uh, upstairs right now on uh, MSNBC, they're nothing but story after story about taking out of al-Baghdadi. You made the impeccable point that it was Hillary Clinton, John Brennan, and, and, and Barack Obama who created ISIS in 2012 over the adamant opposition of Michael Flynn, then the director of the National Intelligence uh, uh, Agency. And it was because of his opposition that Obama, at the recommendation of John Brennan, would fire Michael Flynn, who's an honorable man. They had to get him out as Trump's national security advisor because he would have cr cut through all the smoke and mirrors, and they could not have manipulated Trump as they may be doing even to this day. Right. Yeah. But anyway, uh, and the back Daddy, uh, it, we're hearing about him that he's totally bad on our press, but can we believe our press? Uh, I'm not sure he's a saint or anything else, but. Um, sure, the truth is out there somewhere, but it isn't uh, as they're getting reported here. Well, Scott, also, is, is this Washington Post uh, obituary bizarre? I mean, yeah, it is, isn't it? I mean, talk about offending every American citizen. Anything right. you say, anything positive about this raping savage that that uh, I mean, regardless of the propaganda they put against him, I mean, these people really are dirty and evil and and, and filthy. And we saw that in Libya, James and Joanne Moriarty, who were in Libya, described these scumbags, you know, raping, uh, raping girls, chopping their breasts off, putting them in the, the refrigerators of their parents, chopping these kids up. I mean, this is what the Saudis and the Qataris, who were trained by the CIA and Mossad, do. And they, they've done it in Syria. I was there when they were planning the, the Rand Corporation, Soros uh, Arab Spring. And they flooded Syria in with these people, and they caused absolute devastation. Erdogan was part of it, but then he got his ass kicked by the Russians, and the Russians said, you're not going any further. And the Russians have defeated all of them. P Putin and the Russians should be celebrated as, I think, one of the greatest uh, liberators of mankind in, in the history of, of the last hundred years. He's not a communist. He's a liberator. Senator Dick Black and Chelsea Gabbard went back to Syria and saw the Christian churches that were being destroyed, saw the statues of Mary and Christ that the Wahhabis were plucking out the eyes from the statue. They hated Christ so much, uh, the, the rape and the murder that they were doing. Putin came in and stopped that, not Obama, 
not not anyone. Putin and the Iranians and the Syrians were defending the Syrians Christians, and the Syrians have a lot of I mean mixed people and races. There are a lot of white Russian type of people living up there. So this this compliment of Baghdadi is is really a great insult to the American people. And I said this before too on on press TV or yeah it was press TV I did. I did an interview and I said, the American people love and support Putin for destroying ISIS. This is before Trump came into the picture. And that is right. When you explain this to the American people, Jim, like we do, and say, are you aware of these facts? And we know because we've got people who are on the ground in Syria. Then the average idiot in America goes, well, golly gee, I didn't know all that stuff. Hell yeah, I'm behind the Russians. Hell yeah, I like the Russians. I like Putin. I like anybody that's going to kill my enemy and try and rape my daughter. Jim, go ahead. Yeah. Well said, Scott. We can resume Very this. Good. Meanwhile, a former Israeli intel officer has claimed that Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell work for Israel. Surprise, surprise. When we look at the media today, we realize much of our problem is that the Israelis have taken control of the mass media here in the United States, where I have a collection of a the images of a hundred executives from CNN, all of whom are dual U.S. Israeli citizens, another hundred executives from NBC, all of whom are dual U.S. Israeli citizens, another a hundred executives from the New York Times, all of whom are dual U.S. Israeli citizens. So, for those of us aware of the extent to which Mossad has infiltrated our news, this comes as no surprise. Since the apparent death by suicide of Jeffrey Epstein in a Manhattan prison, where I think we strongly suspect he's actually alive and well, much has come to light about his depraved activities and methods used to sexually abuse underage girls and entrap the rich and powerful for the purpose of blackmail. Epstein's ties to intelligence described in death in a recent Mint Press investigative series have continued to receive minimal mainstream media coverage which has essentially moved on from the Epstein scandal, despite the fact that his many co-conspirators remain on the loose. To those who have examined Epstein's ties to intelligence there are clear links to both U.S. and Israeli, leaving it somewhat open to debate as to which in country's intelligence apparatus was closest to Epstein and most involved in his blackmail sex trafficking activity. A recent interview given by a former high-ranking official in Israeli military intelligence claimed Epstein's sexual blackmail enterprise was an Israeli intelligence operation run for the purpose of entrapping powerful individuals and politicians in the United States and abroad. In an interview with the independent outlet, Nera Tim, Ben Menashe, who himself was involved in the Iran-Contra arms deal, told his interviewer, Shev Shalop, that he had been introduced to Jeffrey Epstein by Robert Maxwell in the mid-1980s. While Maxwell and Ben Menashe's involvement with Iran-Contra was ongoing, Ben Menashe did not specify the year he first met Epstein. Ben Menashe told Shalop that he, Maxwell, wanted us to accept him, Epstein, as part of our group. I'm not denying that we were at the time a group that included Nick Davies, foreign editor of the Maxwell-owned Daily Mirror, Maxwell himself, myself, and our team from Israel doing what we were doing. Past reporting by Seymour Hirsch and others has revealed that Maxwell, Davies, and Ben Menashe were involved in the transfer and sale of military equipment and weapons from Israel to Iran on behalf of Israeli intelligence during this period of time. He then added that Maxwell had stated during the introduction that your Israeli bosses have already approved of Epstein. Shall have later noted that Maxwell had an extensive network in Israel at the time, including the late Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, according to Ben Menashe. Tucker, meanwhile, speaks with an ex-NBC producer on how the Mossad allegedly tapped his phones to cover for Weinstein. Fox News host Tupper Carlson spoke with ex-NBC producer Rich McHugh on how NBC News chairman Andy Lack and NBC News president No Oppenheim allegedly shut down Rowan Farrow's story exposing Harvey Weinstein. 
he followed it up with his interview with McHugh. Fascinating interview with Rowan Farrell's producer, Rich McHugh, Tucker Carlson. Someone broke into your house and tampered with the phone lines, and the suggestion is it was private investigators, former Mossad, hired by Harvey Webstein. Did you ever get to the bottom of it? Turned out, as Rodin reported in Catch and Kill, a new book he's just published, from the time we interviewed Rose McGram, McGowan, we were targeted by two different intelligence firms, including Black Cube, comprised largely of former Mossad members. Regular emails about us went to Harvey's inbox, letting him know precisely which sources were working with Rodin Farrell and Rich McHugh on the HW report. Most terrifying of all, my home in suburban New Jersey was broken into and the phone wires were tampered with. I began communicating through encrypted apps and burner phones, told my wife and four daughters not to answer the door for any stranger. What I faced from my bosses at NBC, though, felt worse than being spied on by Weinstein's paid thug. As a reporter, you expect powerful people you're investigating to play rough. What's hard to experience is the stress and anxiety of being attacked from the inside by the people who are supposed to have your back. No doubt it's just a coincidence that Mossad is connected to both Harvey Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein. Scott, your thoughts and share. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, where is Harvey Weinstein now? He should be in the dock. He should be in an orange jumpsuit. He should be hanging by his member that he violated so many women with <laughs> by piano strings. Uh, and so should Israel, so should the Zionists, so should the Mossad, so, so should all of these uh, intel uh, operatives that have been piranha devouring uh, America for so long. The blackmail against American politicians like Lindsey Graham. How many little toddler boys did Lindsey Graham screw in the ass so that he could get some sort of re-election bag of money? I think Lindsey Graham is uh, one of the great uh, traitors. I don't care how many nice little songs he sings with a Shirley Temple-esque uh, innocence. Uh, right underneath Lindsey Graham's cover is rot and perversion and corruption. And uh, you see that coming out. Uh, so we have Republicans that are, have been blackmailed and are part of this. We have Democrats, of course, uh, all these Democrats is fascinating. The dual Israeli citizens. You 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 know you match next to the names of the political party. Epstein, Democrat. Uh, uh, I mean, all of them. Uh, Weinstein, are, Democrat. Well, thank yeah, you. Go Weinstein. down the list. I didn't have to go by the Hillary Clinton, uh, Democrat. The name. Yeah, but Weinstein, Rosenstein, all these people, Democrats, are also Israeli dual citizens. That tells me something. You know, it's funny, Jim. When I started getting close and hitting hitting on this, hitting a lot of it. And I went in and I talked about Rene Alexander Acosta, the Secretary of Treasury. When he was the Florida uh, attorney uh, in, the, in the feds, he prosecuted uh, this Epstein uh, a deal and covered it up and said he is intelligent. So I was told to back off. But he also, uh, Acosta, prosecuted Brad Birkenfeld and the Swiss bank cover-up of terrorist financing and all of this. So, so Rene Alexander Acosta is up to his neck in this. Uh, it, that's going to come out, but it's fascinating because I had Jason Goodman on Crowdsource the Truth begin to attack me. You know, he tried to say he was asking background questions and all of this, and you know, offline, you and I know what this is all about because the same people that were attacking me through others and saying, "Here, we know this about this guy, this about that guy," and you, you know personally about people coming to you, Jim, and you go, "Yeah, I know the guy too." But the same individuals, the same CIA, Mossad individuals, were going to crowdsource the truth. Uh, uh, Jason Goodman, who I thought was a good guy, I, and I tried to be as gentle as I could. That's not easy for a Scotsman. I said, <laughs> look, Jason, I can't tell you some, some things, and I'm not going to. There's a lot of people trying to get stuff on me, and I'm just not going to answer questions. I'll talk about things that I can talk about. But he went ballistic and started calling me a fraud and a liar and all these things. I thought, uh-huh, uh-huh, funny that all of this starts happening when we're over the target? Funny, is it because you're a Zionist? Is it because you're Jewish? Is it because you're Israeli? Is it because you're all of the above and you're trying to attack everybody? You're attacking Robert David Steele, you're attacking Jim Fetzer, you're attacking me, you're attacking uh, uh, Phil McConnell. Uh, what is it, because we're white Anglo-Saxons or, or Americans or we're not going the Zionist realm? I don't know what it is, 
and I'm not going to spend time on a, a little uh, limp dick mouse like Jason Goodman, but I'll say this, besides uh, killing people who do less than that, um, there are enemies in our midst that pretend to be conservative truth tellers, and they're not. And we can't pay attention. They expose themselves. We turn from them. But it's precisely because we're on target and we're doing discussions like this and exposing the deeper rot underneath a lot of these people that we're being attacked from all sides. So I just wanted to put that that uh, wariness red flag out there, Jim. Well, it's fascinating when uh, Jason Goodman was interviewing me about 9-11 and I was explaining how we knew that a Boeing 767 had not hit the South Tower because if you do a frame by frame count, the plane passes its entire length into the building in the same number of frames it passes its entire length in air, which is a manifest absurdity unless a massive 500,000 ton steel and concrete building provides no more resistance to the trajectory of an aircraft in flight than the air. He cut me off, he cut me off, he cut me off. It was absurd. Yeah. The guy, obviously, when you put all the pieces together, I think it spells out M-O-S-S-A-D. Yeah. He's very well, smooth. He's well, very careful, very very skilled. He's well-trained. But I'm convinced. I am convinced he's an op. Yeah. We have this fascinating billboard campaign in which our dear colleague Scott Bennett has been involved. Ellen Lee Zhao's campaign billboards depicting drug and human trafficking. It's really quite fascinating. They've been illegally removed. Here you have, I take this is the mayor who's making money off of corruption, Scott. You may want to, you know, as we go through these, each of these slides, comment about it because I know you had a hand in all of this. Well, I designed this one that we're looking at right now. I work oh. with artists and uh, uh, that I worked with in counterterrorism and psychological operations. And I put this together and I said, I want a picture of, of uh, London Breed sitting at a desk, dangling a shoe by her toe like she's some, you know, debutante and counting money and having a cigarette like Corella DeVille and some guy in the background taking a little girl away for pedophilia, human trafficking. And then in the background, she's thinking about human uh, uh, homelessness and turning it into money. Jim, we put this out there and they went crazy. The Democrats have went crazy. The media has went crazy. They've generated more airtime for Ellen Zhao. This is like Linda's Daisy for. commercial, which was only played broadcast once and got millions of repeats on the news, Scott. RT did a story on this and I wrote to RT. I said, hey, you, I, I, I designed this if you want to talk to them. <laughs> I had calls coming in, Russia TVs talking about this. This may be why they're still throwing vomit up about Russian assets, because Russian well, TV are, are interviewing us about this. Keep, keep going through the next few slides. Yeah. It's, it's a failed it's, democratic politics. Ellen is the new fresh air for San Francisco in 2019, paid for by Ellen Lee Zhao for mayor. Yep. Yep. Ellen Zhao went to the Republicans and I was there with her and she said, you have done nothing in 50 years. You are all losers. You are worthless. She said those words, Jim. She you was a, give up. In, she was you awesome. Give up on the homeless. Every life matters paid for by Ellen Lee Zhao for mayor 2019. And she came up, yep. we, the, we, the people will rebuild San Francisco for the people paid for by Ellen Lee Zhao for mayor 2019. Homeless crisis created by failed policies in San Francisco, paid by Ellen Lee Zhao for mayor 2019. Scott, I think you've got some powerful points across. Yeah, end the share here for your final comments before the break. She is a great candidate. She is really the symbol of the Renaissance in California. The Asians, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, they have traditional family values. They fought communism. Their relatives have been killed because they didn't have the Second Amendment. They will be damned if California goes communist and, and the Second Amendment is taken. And that is the hope, is that the Asians will rise up and take and lead politically where the whites have fallen apart and turned themselves into transgender, schizophrenic, environment-worshipping lunatics, or as the, as the Asians call them, uh, Geizawa. Uh, that's the hope, is launching them forward. And when they have uh, Caucasians such as myself and others saying, 
this is the way, walk in it. We need people like these leading. We don't need London Breed. We don't need Gavin Newsom. We need real godly people. I think we could see California flip one more time like it did for Scott, Ronald Reagan. Scott, where do, where do the, the Mexicans and Latinos stand on these issues in relation to San Francisco? Well, they've they're they're not they're not uh, they're not in San Francisco so much. They are endemically uh, brainwashed into Democrat policies. Sat, I mean, but ironically, the Catholic Hispanic mind is conservative. It's just they've they've been led astray. But uh, the the Hispanics, uh, you know, are are sort of on the fence. But the Asians and the whites and I mean, others are in support of her. But uh, the, 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 the Communist Party in, in San Francisco, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Communists have flags all over San Francisco. They're coming in and desperately trying to attack Ellen as a racist. But if you're going to call a little Chinese woman who's a Christian a racist, you have lost your mind. You, you have no validity. Scott, does Ellen Zhao have a chance of pulling off this upset against the establishment on both sides? That's the thing. This uh, we, we put these billboards oh. out there. We put them everywhere. They went. They attacked them. They tore them down. We're still putting them up. We're, we're putting lawsuit ideas together and challenging. This could set her over the edge because she's the, un, she's the victim. Hey, there must be something about this woman if everybody hates her. And, you know, she's not offensive. So she could get 50% plus one at the last moment and win by a nose. So we're pushing for it. Well, you'll turn out to have been a brilliant campaign strategist, Scott, if this should happen. <laughs> we love it. We love it. Oh, yeah. Go for the it. Reflect, California seems to me to be turning into a cesspool. I just can't believe how the homeless problem, Los Angeles, San Francisco, feces uh, and needles everywhere, Scott. If any city in the United States deserved to be cleaned up, it's San Francisco. Yeah. And California, and the fires, the power outs, we have power outages all over California and, and fires people are, and it's cold, Jim. I mean, a lot of people will be freezing and dying because especially a lot of older people who can't get out of their homes, you've got power going off and they don't have generators and they, they, they make it illegal to burn wood fires in California too. Really? So it's, it's, it's a very yeah. insane situation that could be, Again, I think if a civil war is going to break out in America, it's going to start here in California. And I'm happy to be the first man holding the banner up. We're going to turn to the California fires after our break. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. I think it looks like California is really turning into being a third world uh, country. Like, I mean, you know, they got, the power has got faults in it. They cause tremendous fires when the smart meters or gas meters and things explode. They can't, they don't have power surges on them. It's just terrible there, uh, all, all the things that are happening in that beautiful country where my daughter and a lot of people that I know live. It's just awesome, awful. So anyway, this has been the first hour of Truth vs. News for October 28th as we approach Halloween, all the scary times that are ahead, especially when we're dealing with truth versus official facts and acts and things. And what really happened in the news, we'll never know because it's, it's really all... Emma, you are fake news. No. Uh, it's, a, it's fake news. So. Uh, stand by for the second hour on Wednesday nights now. You follow immediately, so uh, set your DVRs. Okay, thank you. <laughs>